All right, welcome to Connect in Politic, uh, another episode. We're here with a special guest. Uh, please introduce yourself, tell us your name, where you're currently located, and your favorite snack. Ooh, okay. Um, Bola Dina. I live in Montgomery County, um, Rockville. I'm not sure where this goes, so Montgomery County, Maryland, um, Rockville. USA. Um, USA, right? <laughs> this is global. Uh, this is global. Okay, yeah, so yeah. I just want to be specific. And then my favorite snack, honestly, you know, I, I find it, I don't know why people ask, you know, what's your favorite anything? Because I don't know that I'm that committed to any one thing. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of favorite things. Um, I love chocolate. So anything chocolate has got me from hello. So mm -hmm peanut butter M&Ms or peanut M&Ms, Reese's Pieces, Reese's um, peanut butter cups, um, Rice Krispie Treats. I'm naming all the crap that I have in my house right now. <laughs> <laughs> that Mac insisted, um, who was my husband, by the way, insisted on buying because apparently, you know, part of getting ready for Corona means buying all the snacks at the store. So, yes, yes. Um, so that's all the crap I'm eating right now. I love ice cream, love Ben and Jerry ice cream. Are those snacks? I don't even know what qualifies as snacks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Snacks it's anymore. all snacks. If it's if it's not part of a full meal, I mean, you know, for some people it could be, you know, um, tropical fruits, for instance, uh, like gotcha. mangoes. Like so, snacks is anything that's not like, you know, a, a large meal. meal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Lo I mean, I love pineapples as well. Um, apples. So yeah, I don't have a favorite. It just depends on the mood. And okay. I'm going to maybe be this may be more information than you want but mm -hmm. you know being a woman my time of the month when i'm on my period it's all chocolate everything but then you know once i'm out of that time period then it, it tends to be more healthy so it's so, so that's how it breaks down um but it's more chocolate healthy is now. healthy as well right or you're talking it's about that, sweet chocolate no, i'm talking about milk chocolate I'm, oh, not, okay. I'm not talking about, i'm talking about <laughs> gotcha. i'm talking about no nutritional value chocolate Got um it. yeah okay well, uh, what's your fondest memory from childhood? Oh, wow. You said, once again, you know, like, I don't know that I have a fondest memory. Um, I do look, you know what, let me take it back. So, so growing up in Nigeria, I grew up from the age of two to about nine in Nigeria. And growing up in Nigeria, we lived in, um, on those state, you know, so it's more of a, uh, in of course, it's more, it's, it's not a city city, but it's certainly not um, a village, right? So it's probably more like a rock build to Washington, D.C., mm. right? <clears throat> um, but whenever there was a, a break, a vacation, or what have you, a holiday, I would go to my mom's village where her parents live, and um, that was just always so exciting for me, because it's so different, you know, I mean, she lived in a hut, at the time, which is crazy to think that, I mean, things have progressed in, you know, so many ways since then that you will go, if I go back to the same village, I don't think I would see a hut anywhere there. But back then there were huts there. I mean, they had regular houses as well, but it, it's, there was just such a sense of love and community, you know, that you don't really see in the environment, at least in my day to day, right now, and I know my children don't necessarily have that, especially given the fact that we don't live close to their grandparents, to my brothers and, you know, extended family. Um, but I remember going there and going to the farm. Like, I remember waking up at like 4 a.m. to, you know, go help with my, it wasn't my grandfather, it was my great uncle, his farm, you know, the whole house would wake up real early, it would still be kind of um, cold, or cool outside, you'll go, you put in uh, like a really strong day's work, <laughs> you know, um, plant whatever you needed to plant, prune the, the vegetables, you know, harvest whatever was ready to be harvested, come back, and typically we would make it home probably by, I want to say nine or 10, definitely before it got too hot outside. Um, so maybe my sense of timing is wrong, maybe it would be a little later, but definitely before it got too hot, you would come back, um, and whoever the women in the house were would cook the food and you would eat. And then the second shift would begin in that, um, you know, some of the things that were harvested 
you know, um, my cousins or whoever the family members were would take them to the market to sell. Mm. Um, so I would go along with them and, you know, also sell. It, it was just such an interesting um, time. I always really enjoyed it. And I remember, you know, I had this conversation with my kids all the time that, you know, the reason you waste the reason you're so wasteful is because you don't truly understand the effort that goes into what eventually makes it um, to your dinner table, right? Mm -hmm. Like you don't understand the people who've been at work since before you even woke up this morning and put a strong eight hours, <laughs> you know, worth of work into the day before you woke up. And then the day continued with other stuff that had to be done. So by the time you do have that first meal, you see that there was so much labor that went into it, but also so much love, so much community, so much family time. I mean, you can't but appreciate it. So um, that's probably my favorite childhood memory is going to the village and really understanding that, um, you know, life is much more than, at least life back there is much more than how it's portrayed. You know, when people live in the village and you think, Oh my God, how sad, you know, they're, <laughs> you know, they're so poor. They, they're not poor. I mean, they're so rich in so many ways and their yeah. lives are so layered, you know, but at the end of it is like, there's just so much love and family. So I see it completely differently. Um, but yeah, that's probably my favorite childhood memory. How do you think your, uh, your childhood has helped you, has helped groom you into the person you are today? I think, I um, benefited from seeing how different people lived. So, you know, I mentioned growing up in Nigeria, I would always go to my grandparents' village. Um, <clears throat> but also when I came to America, um, like I never spent a summer at home. You know, even though we, I grew up in New Jersey, I would always spend the summers here in Maryland because I have a lot of cousins here. Um, so I would stay with various cousins and spend time with them. So I think just from a very young age, I knew and appreciated the fact that people just have different perspectives towards how they choose to live, you know? Mm -hmm. So how I lived in my day-to-day -day existence was not necessarily the only way others live and there's no right or wrong to it. Um, but I think it shaped me because it allowed me to um, feel comfortable with um, different perspectives, I would say. So different perspectives in a way that I could appreciate that others could have, um, you know, ideas that are different from mine without necessarily having it shake my understanding of how I, I want to live my life as well. Like all of it is right. It's yeah. all of the above, you know, as opposed yeah. to one or the other. So, yeah. Okay. What's something in your life you're not willing to live without? Um, willing to live without. Um, you're not willing. But I'm not to willing to live without. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's such a good one. And... I'm probably not willing to live without my sense of autonomy, maybe, freedom. You know, I don't know what that, you, I, I want, I like to feel, I don't like to feel caged in. So mm. it's funny, you know, um, growing up, I never thought I would marry, I would get married because that seemed to me like, a situation no one should be in, you know, like it just, I'm like, why? Why are we going to do that when we can be free? <laughs> so, and like I said, you know, once again, like, you know, now that we're talking about this, maybe I've never, I don't like to commit to things for too long. It's the reason why, you know, as soon as school is out, I'm elsewhere, you know, I'm, I, I like to explore. Um, so I like having that sense of freedom, you know, mm -hmm. this, the, um, the ability to decide for myself what I want and not have to feel like I need to justify it, yeah. you know, because the, because having to justify it is also too much effort, too much of a drain on me. So I don't want to do it. So I just want to be free. Let me just do me. <laughs> don't ask me no questions. That's it. So, yeah. Uh, that's good. Uh, what's your favorite thing to do for self-care? Oh my God. More recently, yoga. I love yoga. And I think yoga, because I'm on a, um, a journey to really, um, so 
sort of just push the boundaries, um, to just push myself beyond the limitations that I've set for myself. Um, I realized probably about a year or so ago that um, there's some ideas about myself or the, my persona, you know, who I'm supposed to be that are really limiting. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'll look at people who, you know, even to the point of, you know, working out, you know, I'll look at others and I'm like, wow, how amazing to be someone who just works out. It's too bad it's not me. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I just naturally thought, that's what they do. I don't do that. You know what yeah. I mean? Which is so ridiculous. So, but you, but you know, you, you said that to me. Oh, have I? <laughs> yeah, you was like, that's what you do. I don't, do I, mean, I, don't, I don't, I can't, I don't understand why. So, yeah, there's so many things that I just was just self selecting <laughs> out of because uh. I had a perspective and an idea for, you know, my. My, what my narrative was, who I'm supposed to be. Mm. And it was very, and I think it's it's a very limited what that perspective is or what that narrative is and how it played out. So, um, so I sort of actually just stumbled onto yoga um, during the last um, government shutdown last year when the government decided they weren't going to fund themselves and everybody stopped going to work. So I had none but time. Um, so joined um, Lifetime. And because I'm not one to naturally, you know, want to run aggressively on a treadmill or, you know, do whatever, yoga just seemed like a nice option to, mm -hmm. um, you know, start, um, select, to opt into. And it's been life-changing um, just because it works on your mind, body, and soul, right? So you're, the idea that you're not in competition with someone else or, you know, the person next to you who's doing all of the the shades and has been doing yoga for 10 years and all of that, um, you know, should not reflect on whether you're doing it right. And if you are as progressed as you need to be, it's just a one day at a time journey. And the competition is really with yourself in that moment, you know, and it changes from moment to moment. So if you tell yourself that I'm not able to go into that shape or my mind is not into it today, you're not going to push beyond that, you know, so every day you kind of have to be ready to push beyond the chatter of limitation that you place on yourself and, um, you know, take a breath and push through and, but also be compassionate, you know, so if you're not able to summon up the energy or whatever is required in that moment to show up for yourself, you know, being okay with it, understanding that, you know, tomorrow is another day, you know, the next moment is another moment for me to try again and be better. So I really enjoy yoga for, for all of that. It's good, it's good. Yeah. What motivates you? What motivates me? Um, manifesting. Um, it's funny. Um, I actually, did have a conversation about this the other day. Yeah, I like, I think, so another thing I didn't think I was, was a creative, um, you know, I don't see myself as an um, artist per se. So I'll see someone who, you know, is a poet or draws a painting or, um, you know, expresses themselves in different ways. And I've always just um, been intrigued by the process that goes into um, creating something out of nothing. I, I think that's probably as close to God as we can get is just conjuring up something that didn't exist before and bringing it into existence. I think that's pretty powerful. So for me, um, I realized the more I started exploring the things that um, kind of weigh on me, you know, the things that inspire me or, you know, whatever it is that um, all of a sudden um, I think about, I've started allowing myself to see it through, you know, try to actually manifest it beyond um, the, the thought. Um, and when I'm able to do that, it's actually pretty cool. So, so for me, it's the idea of dreaming beyond my wildest ex, um, expectations, no matter what that dream is, and actually working to um, bring it into fruition. Good. What do you do in your professional life? In how did you get there? My professional life. Um, so professionally, I work with, um, I'm a consultant, business consultant. I work with um, small businesses and entrepreneurs to help them manifest as well, you know, help them bring their ideas for, forward. Um, but also, you know, even with businesses that are 
feeling stuck, I help them think about, you know, how to explore the possibilities beyond their current um, existence, you know, and how could they, um, how can I inspire them to um, have them feel empowered to actually get unstuck and move forward and, mm -hmm. um, you know, advance their business or their objective in a way that they didn't think they could. So, so yeah, that's what I do. Um, and what's your other question? How did you get there? How did I get there? I um, was, a, I've been a consultant all of my career. I used to work as an um, in-house consultant for a pharmaceutical company, um, you know, sort of interfacing between the business and IT to um, get their requirements and then help them work with IT to develop systems. Um, and then more recently, I've been working as a consultant with, um, you know, federal agencies to implement various regulations and, um, you know, help them with various um, systems implementation. So um, I think I eventually got to a point where I realized um, I enjoy working with people and wanted to have greater impact um, by actually working at a much smaller level um, meaning with entrepreneurs and small businesses. So it's still the same approach, um, still the same type of work, but it's just um, with a different um, group of people. Mm -hmm. What's the riskiest thing you've done professionally? Quitting my job <laughs> with, without, a, without a plan B. Um, was that risky? So it's funny, I don't, it's, it I think to, um, so most people listening, I think they probably would say that was the riskiest thing. Uh, but to me, the riskiest thing would have been to not do it, you know, and, and, and I don't actually value my professional life. I don't place much value on it. So when people say, oh, my God, that's career suicide or whatever, I'm like, I'm sorry, am I still alive? I don't care <laughs> what career suicide, you know, like I've never, I'm not, I've never been <laughs> one to want to climb up the ladder or what would people say? You know what I mean? Like that, that doesn't resonate with me as much. Mm -hmm. So I have a different approach to, you know, how I go about my, my career or profession. You know, if it feels good to me, I do it. If it doesn't, I don't, right? So, uh, but I do think, you know, just leaving my job um, would probably be perceived as um, risky because I didn't have a plan B per se, um, but I knew the job no longer served me. So I, I didn't feel like my spirit needed to continue to be subjected to what now became a toxic environment from my perspective. So I had to leave. Uh, but I, I think it would be considered risky because I had been at the firm for probably going on 10 years. I don't know, I guess. Yeah, 10 wow. years or so. And I had climbed up the ladder and I had done, you know, some, you know, I had the titles or whatever. And my next step was to be a um, partner, um, which I think most people work their whole lives for, you know, in certain spaces. Um, yeah, but, but I just couldn't do it. I couldn't devote any more energy to that space. And I knew I had to leave. So, yeah. Yeah. What's, what's one thing you would love to learn, but you haven't gotten to yet? I would love to be an artist. So, you know, I think I touched on that um, a bit earlier. I would love, I, I just, I don't understand, you know, like, let's take someone who is a graphic artist, for instance, like someone creates, um, like, you, like you, you just created a piece of art. And especially when you're creating, like, it's one thing for you to draw or paint a picture of a tree that you're looking at, but it's another thing for you to paint pictures of worlds that don't exist. Mm -hmm. Where is that coming from? <laughs> you know, like, wh wh what is the journey or what's the process that your mind is going through? What are you tapping into to be able to bring something that does not exist into existence? And I can see it and I can appreciate it and I see the beauty in it. I think that's fascinating. I think people who can draw faces of people that don't exist is baffling to me. You know, like it's once again, it's one thing for you to draw. Oh, I'm going to draw. Uh, um, uh, I'm going to do a portrait of Bola. This is what Bola looks like. I can look at Bola. I can replicate it. 
but you're drawing a face of someone that does not exist. Where's that coming? I mean, I'm so fascinated by that. I would love to be able to tap into that space. Another example is, you know, we were um, watching the autobiography of, I forget the name of the jazz singer. It wasn't Duke Ellington, but one of those, right? Um, and they said, you know, part of what sets jazz apart in general from a lot of other music genres is just your ability to rip. You know, you're not following any, you know, like music, um, whatever per se. Like you're just playing beautiful notes in ways that is so amazing. But you, you, like, where are you, where are you coming up with that? I, I want to know how is this happening. So I think I think I'm a great uh, mimic. You know, I can mimic a lot of things, but I, I don't believe I can originate in in ways that I think artists can. Yeah. I would love to be able to occupy that space. That's interesting. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, as you were saying that, well, I, I, I take it you're referring to a combination of visual artists, you know, like sculptors, painters, those graphic artists, and then, um, you know, I guess musicians, for instance. But as you're saying it, you know, two things pop to mind. One is, you know, I feel that at a at some level, we're all artists, you know, especially given um, going with your definition or, you know, the examples you gave, right? Somebody coming up with something that's not there and by some work of magic, they able to produce something that doesn't currently exist, right? Right. Um, so that could, for one, you would say, you know, all women or all men and women are magicians by being able to produce mm -hmm. life, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, not just magicians, but artists, right? You, you, you've created this thing out of nothing, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and then the other part of it is, um, you know, as, I, like, I, I think, you know, creativity, because it, it sounds like what you're talking about more so is tapping into your creative side, you know, like, uh -huh. um, and I think, uh, there's tears in creativity, right? There's like, you know, of course, there's the, the, the pure savants or, you know, geniuses or whatever you want to call it. But then I think, you know, there's a big part of creativity, which is um, where you learn a lot and you connect the dots. Yeah. And then by connecting the dots, you start entering a new space, mm -hmm. right? Because you've, you've, you know, you've learned so much um, or you've seen so many trends or you've seen so many faces, you know, so when, when you give an example of somebody who draws like a face that's not there, they've seen so many faces. So when they're drawing a face that's not present, they have a certain imagery in mind of, you know, uh, scope uh, of, um, you know, the relations of the eyes yeah. or, you know, and part of it is like fantasy It's part of it is a face They've never, so they've seen a lot of different faces, but they've yeah. never seen this face that they want to see. Gotcha. Right? So it's, this, it's where you find, so with jazz or with, uh, you know, a lot of music, when people are putting sounds and words together and those kind of things, that's, a lot of it is that where they, you know, like most great artists or musicians in particular are students of the game. Yeah. Right? And you find that in, and so they, you know, like you talk, you brought up uh, earlier, we we're talking about Nas, but like, you know, somebody like Nas, like he, he didn't just study rap, you know, he studied the entire musical genre. Mm -hmm. right? So that when mm -hmm. he's creating music or Jay or all these other guys, or, you know, any of these musicians, they're pulling from all these different places that has inspired them. And then, yeah. they're, you know, it's like, you know, when you're cooking, right? Like, so yeah. if, you, if you're a cook, that's another mm -hmm. example of being an artist, right? Mm -hmm. If you can cook, your artist anyway yeah so, um but i just wanted to touch on that on uh i think we you know and it's just we give a lot of uh, credence to 
large visual artists or large uh, mm. mus musicians or but at the core i think we we're all being creative you know in so many aspects of our life even even the fact that you know we can put words together right so somebody asks you a question so like this for instance there's a lot of creativity that comes into this right you're expressing mm. yourself there's a, you could you could express yourself i can ask you a question you could just make you could just make sounds <laughs> but but you're able to pull because of your um you know your understanding of the english language based this yeah you pull all these different words together and then come up with a coherent um sentence that yeah. creates this new response like no one has said like the questions i'm going to ask you or the questions i've asked you no one has responded exactly the way you responded yeah right so that there's levels of creativity there um in my book, baby. Yeah. No, I think that makes sense. And, you know, I, I was going to say, because I didn't add poets to the list. Right. I mean, that I think that's also another, yeah. uh, you know, group of artists that I'm so inspired by, you know, because I think poetry to me is beautiful, not necessarily because the words sound good. Um, because, yeah, I mean, it, it, that's part of it, right? Because, you know, you're able to rhyme. But what makes poetry art to me is that you can conjure up feelings in me through your words yeah. just because of how the words sound but also the meanings behind the word i mean that's amazing that's pretty beautiful so it's funny i'm not a uh, um, a rap um enthusiast per se but I, that's why i personally love um lil wayne which is it's you probably didn't expect me to say that <laughs> i think the man is a genius how is he doing that? Like he's so poetic, yeah. but then the pictures that he paints, I think, is yeah. uh, pretty amazing. Yeah. However debaucherous they may be sometimes. Yes. So yes. yeah. That, but that's part of art, right? Like, so it's part of it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, can you think of any advice that you would give your younger self? It's not that serious, and and I and I I, I say that almost. Um, you know, not wanting to be as emphatic as I am, but that's just the bottom line. Like none of it, not, none of this is that serious. Um, okay, so how I'm gonna put it, and I've been using this example lately. Um, I think life is like an amusement park. You see what I'm saying? I thought you were gonna say like a box of chocolates. Yeah. <laughs> Even though that would be another appropriate. <laughs> well, you know where that's life. from, right? Do you know where that's from? Forrest Gump, right? Yeah. Unless, yeah. yeah. No, no. I think it's like an amusement park, uh -huh. and and I, I think you know when you're going to an amusement park, you understand there's a time limit to it, right? You only got but six good hours, maybe. You don't go from ten, maybe eight, ten to six. That's all the time you got, mm. you know. But you eagerly, you know what, I'm going to say an amusement park, but I'm also going to give another example of what I, how I think we should approach life. But you go understanding that there's a time limit and understanding that each of the rides are going to vary. They're also limited, you know, in terms of the time. But you're not, um, you're not mourning the fact that each of the rides are only about 30 seconds long. You, like you're all in on the ride. It doesn't matter if it takes two hours on the line before you get on, you're willing to do that knowing that the experience is going to be worth it. You, I mean, you may be sweating and all this other stuff, but by the time you finally experience it, it's all worth it. And then you go on maybe six or 10 different rides or whatever, and then you leave and you're okay with it. You're okay that the experience ended. And I say that meaning you're gonna have relationships. You know, some people are going to come into your life and it's going to be amazing. They're going to end and it's okay. You're going to have certain experiences with work, you know, certain trials and tribulations and what have you. Um, embrace them for what they are, knowing that this is all part of the, it's, it's part of the ride. You know, you're going to go, it was what it was. Like you don't go on some random ride that six flight, hoping that it just never ended. It's not realistic. <laughs> you know what I mean? Accept life for what it is. You know, some rides are going to be longer than others. Some are going to require, have longer lines than others. Some are going to be close. You've been in line all day and now, you know, they're like, sorry, we're done. You know, but there are other rides that you can get on. It's okay. You know what I mean? So I just feel like it's not that serious. Just go with the flow and be ready for the adventure. And I think it's okay. 
so that's an example of how I think we, that's what, you know, an example of how I think we should experience life, but mm -hmm. how we should actually approach life as well is from a, have you ever been in the, um, those escape rooms? With uh, escape rooms. the ones with mirrors or, no? Sorry, I must have hit the mute button. What did you say? The, the ones with mirrors? No, maybe. I, I think, yes, some of them. So the escape room, they have them in DC is, um, you know, you go in and you're going to have to leverage a set of clues that you'll discover along the way to try to figure out how to get out. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So yeah. you probably have a good sense for it. Um, it's interesting because for the most part, you go in and you need to work together with other people, right? Some of them you brought in, they came with you as a part of your group, others you meet while there, but you all need to work together and stumble on the clues and um, you know, some things you're gonna get right, other things you're not, but it's an experience, right? Um, and at the end of the day, you're going to get out. Everybody gets out. No one has ever gotten stuck in the room. You're gonna get out. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you may need to call for the operator to say, I'm going to need a clue here because we're stuck, you know, mm -hmm. and the, they'll give, but at the end of the day, it doesn't shake who you are. It doesn't shake you to your core, right? Yeah. So, you know, some things you're going to know naturally, some things you're not, but at the end of the day, you don't take it seriously because you understand you're going to get out. And I say that to um, kind of um, allow us to, um, give ourselves the permission to try new things you know like like when it doesn't when things don't work out it's kind of like in the escape room you may go in thinking oh i know i'm gonna crack this i think it's definitely behind door number two and it turns out it's not it doesn't shake who you are as a human being you just realize oh okay well let me go back to the drawing table let me figure it out um but at the end of the day number one we're all gonna die you know what i mean so how you choose to enjoy the process the journey the ride is up to you, but understand that it's not that serious. You can leverage people along the way. When you have failings, it's not the end of the world. It doesn't say anything about your ability or lack thereof or what have you. It just means that that wasn't the right door. Mm -hmm. Try another door. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like life is not that serious. Just to take it as a journey. And a lot of people, I think, use the metaphor of it's almost like, you know, like, oh my God, we got to go to war with life. I actually think you can pretty much enjoy life. You know, life is not something to be endured. I think it's something to be enjoyed, you know, and if I had that perspective um, sooner, I think I would be, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm in a pretty good space right now, um, but I think that's my advice. It's, you, if you find yourself trying to endure life, I, I think you need to take a step back and, and recalibrate. You're probably not doing it right you should be enjoying every aspect of it it's not that serious calm down so that's my that's my thing got yeah. it got it um i think you should um consider turning those frameworks into almost like pictographic uh you know short video clips um mm. you know like the framework of approaching life uh, like you're going to an amusement park or an escape room, etc. Because uh, mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think that's an that's a, an a, an advice or an approach that a lot of people could benefit from. Mm -hmm. Not just, you know, and but it's something that in it's it's easily understood than just a philosophical discussion. You know, especially yeah. if you see it in pictures or whatever it is, because, you know, we, we, as human beings, we learn through stories. And so somebody, if you literally run through the story of going to the amusement park and there's these, you know, 20 rides or whatever it is, and, you know, and, and then, you know, just bring it all together at the end, like, you know, and that's life. <laughs> it's like, just, if you, if you just look at life through those lens, um, you know, things could be a lot better for you along the way so no, that's good what would you say what has been the toughest thing you've had to tackle and what helped you get through it i would say um the toughest 
thing that I've had to tackle was probably my, um, and, and I don't, <clears throat> I'm laughing because it just sounds, sounds terrible. I was going to say my marriage, you know, so I'm like, oh my God, tackling my marriage, that's just, <laughs> sounds terrible. <laughs> okay. As you're about to say this, uh, I, I want you to know that interestingly <laughs> enough that out of let's just say seven married people that I've interviewed thus far, uh -huh. uh, about five of them, that's been their <laughs> response. But it, it 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 varies on so many different levels on on yeah. how they the things they say. So you know yeah. whatever you're gonna say, um, don't feel like you're alone in okay. your response <laughs> <laughs> to it to this being the toughest that you had to tackle and how it will help you get through it so yeah yeah and i would say so the reason i say that is because obviously for those who are married um you know when you are interacting with someone on a daily basis and you are forced to work on the same projects you know but you have completely different approaches or understanding of what the issue is what the problem is how it should be approached um the resources to be leveraged the time frame um, within which those problems should be tackled you know all of those things it becomes a very difficult thing especially for someone who is very much into autonomy doing me <laughs> you know what i mean like i'm not trying to justify myself to too many people it's just it's, it's a waste of energy from my perspective so i think um i think marriage really forces you on the journey of self-discovery for me if you're going to do it right i think you're going to have to unlearn everything you've learned you've known about marriage relationships what the fairy tale is all of that and you then need to, you need to deconstruct all of that and get back to basics and understand how will this work for us um, in a way that um, you know both parties in the family as a unit um, could still feel like they are a cohesive unit, right? Like you're still working together. Um, so yeah, that was difficult. It was difficult for me to. Um, get rid of all of my expectations of um, my husband, which then forced me to um, reassess the expectations I have uh, I had of other people, um, or even um, you know better learn how to um, kind of um, communicate my thoughts and feelings without having it be something that is um, a must to do or you know, something you need to fulfill for me as opposed to, you know, how can I, um, you know, fulfill my own needs, um, address the issues that I have um, when I need help, you know, when and how should I ask for that help, knowing that if you're not able to provide that help, it should still be okay, right? Like, like how do you manage all of that in a way where, um, you know, it, it's not as if the ground you know, it's constantly being pulled from underneath you, you know, like you still feel like you're on strong footing. So yeah, I would say, you know, getting a sense of that was very difficult, but once I cracked, you know, how we could be married and healthy, um, you know, and, and be in, and operate in a healthy space, I feel like that really started the journey for me to um, really, um, get to better know myself and how I'm going to be happy with who I am. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so it, it, I had to crack that first. I had to go through that process and that led me down the path that I'm on right now, um, which essentially is at the end of the day, um, the only thing that you can control and that you should be worried about is yourself, you know, not even your children. I, I mean, as much as we want to, um influence them you know they're their own human beings they're going to do what they want to do you know we may have ideas um for them and what we would like for them to do uh but at the end of the day the only thing we can hope for is that they're happy 
yeah, and whatever happiness means to them and be okay with that. So, yeah. Cool, cool. Uh, if you won the lottery tomorrow, and I'm talking about the big lottery, not scratch, you know, not a hundred dollars, but a couple hundred millions. Who are some of the people you will give money to? If I won the big lottery, how big? We're talking about 500 million. Why do I gotta give money away? <laughs> <laughs> well, I that's mean, the thing. <laughs> that's the thing. You don't have to, but who you. Said that? Uh, <laughs> if, if you if you decided to, who are some of the people that you would give money to? Or you can keep it all for yourself. That that's you know that that's a. <laughs> that's an option. <laughs> that's that is an option. There are a lot of options in life. <laughs> who would I give money to? Um. So, so this is going to, it's difficult for me to, okay. I, I actually don't necessarily um, place the same value on money as a lot of people do, I think, you know, from my, from my understanding. I think money is um, one means to an end. But there's so many means to an end, you know, like there's your network, there's time, there's your creativity, there's your willingness to, you know, address a problem, you know, like money is just one element, but there's so many different ways that that can be um, um, replicated, you know, or, esti you know, like you can approximate it, basically. Um, so I say that to say that I don't necessarily see money as something that could, um, um, address the, the, the pressing, the most pressing issues that most of the people in my life that I care about have. However, if I think about my biggest um, sort of um, headache right now, it's my student loans. So if I could just pay those off, I mean, to be honest, that's all I, like, you know, that, you know, every conversation we have, Damn Sally got to come into the conversation. He, she's going to squeeze her way into it one way or the other. Uh, but to be honest, mm. I can't imagine, like if I actually got rid of my debt, my student loans, uh. I would be the freest person ever. So if I, I mean, I would be willing to pay off all the people in my life's student loans. Because to me, I think that's the biggest constraint. Like someone imposing on you and your time and forcing you to do things you don't want to do so you can pay off some sort of debt to me is just the definition of slavery <laughs> you know what i mean and and i think you can't even think about how to be creative you can't think about how to be free you can't explore you know who you want to be you can't enjoy the ride you know when when someone is constantly knocking on your door asking to be paid, you know? So for me, I probably would try to pay off as many people's debt that I could as possible. Um, because after that, then you're free to create and paint whatever, you know, what, you can paint the world in whatever colors you want. You can live your life however way. Cause I don't think money really then, you know, means, you know, now I can live comfortably. Cause I think we all kind of want to explore ourselves and you know, better um, understand what it means to be, um, you know, living our potentials. But you can't do that when you're hampered by something else. But once I can free you of that, I think people can do amazing things. So yeah, that's probably how I would spend it. Uh, and for the final question, how do you define success? Freedom. That's what it says. If you wake up every day and you can decide what you're gonna do with your time, that's freedom. I mean, I remember, you know, as you know, I told you just being in Nigeria, going to the village and these people just waking up, enjoying the cool breeze, having family around, friends around, you eat whatever you want, whenever. Um, and ain't nobody calling you to, you know, you're not opening your mailbox and, <laughs> you know, a hundred letters falling through. Let me tell you. <laughs> so yeah, let me just quickly say that that's definitely a success. But I don't know, I used to, like, I used to have anxiety, like, in anxious 
relationship with my mailbox. Did you ever feel that? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Because when I first started work, (laughs) (laughs) I'm telling you, these bill collectors, I mean, they tortured me for a good while because I just, I I don't think I could get control of, you know, how to pay my bills on time because I was always so anxious about it. Um, (laughs) So bills would just pile up and I would open the mailbox and I would just go into depression and all of that. That's no way to live. So, and that certainly does not give you a sense of freedom. So I want to wake up and nobody calling my phone and nobody sending reminder letters to pay. Um, And you just do whatever you want. I think, I think that's success. I think that's success. Yeah. Nice, nice. That, that, that's a good way to end it. Um, a mix of laughter and uh, seriousness. Well, yeah. we connected, we politic, and we will do this again in the near future. There's actually, you know, uh, you touched on a few things that there should be a part two to uh, mm. to address, but we'll address it uh, in the near future. Thanks again. Let me, uh, this was great. This was great, Mike. I really.